Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. And we're continuing our session on developments in isogeny-based cryptosystem. With today, we're very happy to have Ben Smith, who's talking about isogenies in genus two for cryptographic applications. And Ben, is it all right if we video this talk? That's fine, go ahead. Oh yeah, and feel free to ask um, questions at any, at any point. Wonderful, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks Rachel. Uh, thanks to Drew and the, the organizers for, for giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you all. The results I'll be talking about here, um, there's only a few that are really, that I was involved in, but the other people that were involved in those papers, uh, Votic Kastrick, uh, Craig Costello, uh, Thomas de Cru and uh, Enric Florit. And it was actually Enric who introduced me to this seminar in uh, in March two years ago, so about two and a half years ago. Um, so that's how I sort of discovered this, and it's it's cool to now, you know, be be talking here about uh, work that, that we did together, starting more or less in that week. Um, so so far in this series, uh, you've heard from Stephen and Kristen, and and we've seen that isogeny-based cryptosystems basically fall into two categories. There's uh, the cryptosystems that are based on group actions. And I think uh, Stephen uh, spent a lot of time on these. So things like uh, seaside key exchange, and then uh, there's sea, uh, sea fish uh, signatures and a series of other things. Uh, and then there's everything else, which is crypto that's based on some, well, we'll say the, the full super singular isogeny graph uh, for elliptic curves, even if it doesn't use the entire graph. and those systems, uh, so Kristen mentioned the hash of the future, or at least uh, the hash of what was a future once um, uh, two weeks ago. Um, you've also, I, I think, uh, briefly seen SADH and uh, Psych, which are now broken. Uh, we'll be hearing about that in, the, in a couple of weeks' time. And then uh, there's other interesting schemes like uh, skin sign signatures, uh, which uh, Luke will be talking about in, uh, well, a few more weeks again. So that's what everyone else is talking about. And we've seen there's lots of things going on. So then the question is uh, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and that is um, basically trying to do anything at all in genus two. And you'd say, well, why would you do this? Well, it's, it's because it's just what we do. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Jane Austen understands the human mind uh, much better than I do, uh, but even even I can say that uh, this is just what happens. Someone designs an elliptic crypto system. Once people get the idea that it's interesting or that it might work, uh, they immediately start plugging in Jacobians of genus two curves or hyperelliptic Jacobians or abelian varieties and, and seeing what happens. So what we want to do is, is basically that. In this, case, in this context, when I say genus two, what, what I really mean is um, not necessarily genus two curves. I mean, principally polarized abelian surfaces. And more generally, you could think of uh, principally polarized abelian varieties in dimension three or four or however far you like, but we've got to start somewhere and that'll be uh, genus two, which lets us do things in a really uh, kind of middle brow, concrete, uh, effective way. Uh, and, and ultimately, uh, you know, produce something that's uh, potentially practical. This is not a completely crazy thing to do. I mean, it's not generalization just for the sake of it. Uh, when you look at uh, when people have, you know, used this overwhelming uh, urge to generalize to genus two um, in the context of elliptic curve cryptography, uh, we've seen some nice practical results. And so, I'm including just one reference in the reference list uh, at the end, um, but uh, from the bibliography there, you'll you'll see uh, several instances where people have used uh, things like fast uh, arithmetic on Kuma surfaces. Uh, to really uh, produce high-performance cryptographic software. So I'm not just talking about uh, abstract generalizations, but but these uh, this higher-dimensional geometry in the past has actually given us um, real-world performance and uh, practical improvements. So knowing that, you think, okay, well, let's take some of these uh, maybe more experimental elliptic isogeny-based cryptosystems, plug in genus two, and uh, and see what happens to us. It's not necessarily going to be like uh, pure magic. I mean, uh, there's there's often a limit to uh, 
uh, to how good things can get before they turn bad. And in the context of a discrete log-based crypto, it turns out that genus two is competitive and then starting from genus three and then the, the further you go, the less competitive you get. And not just in terms of uh, the speed that you need for, uh, for equivalent security, uh, the speed that you need, the speed that you get for equivalent uh, security, but also in terms of the, the key sizes and things like this, the amount of data and bandwidth that you end up using. And what we find is that uh, when you want say a genus three, genus four, genus five, uh, Jacobian or, or abelian variety, to do something like a traditional public key cryptography, the keys start to blow up and get big. And, and that means we say it's uh, less cryptographically efficient. So genus one and two are a good uh, classical uh, sweet spot. And now uh, let's uh, move to, to isogenies and see what happens. In this talk, we're going to ignore uh, genus two group action based cryptography. So all of this stuff like uh, Seaside and uh, and Kuvany and uh, Rostovsev and Stolbanov. Um, that's not because it's less worthy of uh, attention. It's just that, well, first of all, we've only got an hour. Second of all, uh, very little has been done on this subject. Uh, so there's not much that I can really say about it. One reason why little has been done, it's not that it's impossible, but it's obviously more complicated. I mean, uh, when you're talking about the action of uh, the class group of a common uh, endomorphism ring, on a bunch of elliptic curves, at least in the ordinary case, you're talking about uh, quadratic imaginary rings, which are kind of the simplest thing you, that you have that is not just the rational integers. When you go to the, the genus two equivalent, well, suddenly your, your real subring is no longer the integers, it becomes like a, a real quadratic subring. Uh, and that means you have, for example, uh, well, already you have more complicated cr class groups. Uh, also, the, you have things like real units. Uh, you have units that are no longer like a, a finite order, for example. And all of these things have potential to, to make things a bit weird. Uh, the group action uh, is then also uh, much more complicated to compute on a, on a purely algorithmic level. And given that in, uh, in group action-based crypto, uh, the, the fact that the group action is slow and uh, hard to do in constant time is, is kind of the... I mean, that's the big problem we need to, to solve algor algorithmically at the moment. Um, we better get some work done there in genus one and work out what the right way of doing things there is before we go uh, into genus two. So what we're going to do is focus exclusively on the very simplest example that we have um, of a crypto system. So the simplest thing in the everything else class, and this is uh, the Charles Goren Lauter hash function uh, that, that we've met before. It's simplest in the sense that uh, there, are, there are very few moving parts uh, and we don't have to think about things like public keys and private keys and so on. It's a public function uh, that's still uh, very potentially useful in cryptography. This is a hash function that's based on uh, walks in uh, a certain super singular isogeny graph. So here, uh, like throughout the talk, uh, P is always a prime typically a big one. And so S1 of P is super singular elliptic curve. So the one is just for the dimension or the genus. Okay? This is uh, up to isomorphism. So you, you might identify these with things like uh, just the, the J invariants in FP squared or the super singular J invariants. And then by looking at L isogenies between these, we get an L isogeny graph, uh, which we'll call gamma one LP. Uh, the isogeny graph is, first of all, connected. Uh, it's L plus one regular. So there are L plus one, uh, since L is you know, not equal to P, uh, the, the L torsion is a, is a rank two Z mod L module. So there's L plus one uh, order L subgroups in there, which means there's L plus one isogenies leaving any given vertex, uh, any given uh, super singular elliptic curve. Some of them might be isomorphic to each other and then uh, we're going to end up with the multiplicity on, uh, on this graph. Uh, so maybe we should say it's actually like a, a generally like a directed graph, but most of the time, as we'll see, it's close enough to, to undirected to, to be able to say that it's, it's an expander in some sense. So it's a Ramanujan graph and has excellent expansion properties. And in particular, if you take a random walk in this graph, once you've gone far enough, and that far enough is quite short, it's a small multiple of log p, then uh, the, the ending vertex of your walk, um, you're, you're getting a uniform distribution 
on the vertices of the graph. So what that means is once you've walked uh, a small multiple of uh, log p uh, steps in this graph, you could be anywhere in it. You're, you're really, uh, you're, you're now uh, on a random uh, vertex in this graph. So in general, it's a directed weighted graph. Uh, we say that uh, an edge, so between uh, two isomorphism classes of curves has weight n if there's n distinct kernels um, in the L-torsion uh, of the domain where the codomain is, is isomorphic here. And these distinct kernels form an orbit under the reduced automorphism group. So obviously uh, every kernel is fixed by plus or minus one. So talking about the minus one automorphism doesn't really do anything uh, interesting for us here. So we'll just portion it away and look at the remaining automorphisms. You know that the only elliptic curves with, uh, with unusual automorphisms, well, there's J invariant zero and 1728. So those are the only vertices where there's going to be uh, edges with actual multiplicity. Now for every uh, edge going in one direction, you know, there's a dual edge coming back in the other direction. We have a dual isogenies. Uh, but multiple edges in one direction uh, generally share a single dual in the other. So that's where this, uh, where this graph suddenly fails to be something like a, a weighted, uh, an undirected weighted graph. But that failure is kind of limited. There's only two neighborhoods where things can go wrong. And so when you're trying to imagine this graph, uh, globally, it's a bit of a mess, right? But uh, locally, at least, you go, okay, well, it's, let's say we take uh, L equals two, and uh, we'll be focusing on L equals two in this talk, we're looking at a three regular graph. And so you could take a sort of local generic neighborhood here uh, where you've got three outward arrows to some kind of elliptic curve and uh, with the duals coming back. And then you're going to paste copies of this together and, uh, and sort of fill out uh, you know, the entire graph with this. So just uh, gluing on more of these edge neighborhoods around each of the vertices and growing it outwards. It's just that occasionally one of these uh, dotted E things might actually be J invariant zero, in which case the three outward arrows will always go to the same codomain and there'll just be one arrow coming back. And the other two arrows from, uh, from that top E vertex will be moving somewhere further away. And then similarly for the 1728 J invariant, uh, there's going to be a, like a loop here an edge from the vertex to itself, a double edge going out and, and so on. But the moral here is that, I mean, there are like P over 12 super singular vertices here, roughly speaking in the graph, uh, P over 12 or something that's an integer near there. And almost everywhere, no matter how big P gets, you're really looking like a bunch of copies of this, uh, this three regular neighborhood just uh, pasted uh, onto each other. There's only two vertices in the whole thing where things can get weird. So we think we've got things uh, pretty much under control for this graph. Now, the, the interesting algorithmic problem for us today is uh, the, the isogeny problem, uh, the problem of computing an isogeny between two curves that are known to be isogenous. Uh, and here, the, the degree is fixed to be a, a power of L. So given two elliptic curves, E and E prime, somewhere uh, in, in this set, or, or vertices in this graph, just find a path between the two of them. There's a classical solution to this based on uh, random walks. So that's square rooting uh, the, the search space. Uh, and so given that there's basically P over 12 vertices, we're looking at about root P here, uh, steps. Um, and that's something that's uh, not too hard to parallelize either. Uh, and then there's a quantum solution uh, that's a square root of that again. So like a fourth root of P thing. So the, this problem of uh, computing isogenies, I mean, uh, we've mentioned it already in this series is, is one of the, uh, the fundamental or classic problems. It's uh, really related to the security of this hash function that we want to look at. So let's look at the Charles Gorin louder function again to, to sort of recall this and uh, bring it back to mind. First of all, what is a cryptographic hash function? First of all, a cryptographic hash function uh, has, well, there's an O in cryptographic, but otherwise it just takes arbitrary length uh, binary strings as input, so just data, and it's gonna output some n-bit string, so a fixed length tag, if you like. There are three classic security properties that you want. Pre-image resistance, which means it's hard to find a pre-image for any uh, target in the code domain. Collision resistance, so it's hard to find two inputs that give you the same output. And then second pre-image resistance, uh, which is, well, I mean, often 
you know a pre-image. You know, someone's hashed a message or hashed some data. The data is public. The hash is uh, is public. But then, if you want to go and uh, you know, like uh, fake a Mac or a signature or something, at this point, you're going to need a, a different piece of data that has the same hash. So it, it looks like collision resistance, but where one of the inputs is actually fixed in advance. In an ideal world, if you've got n bit outputs, uh, you're going to need uh, about n bits of effort to find a pre image. So, about two to the n operations, more or less. Um, collision resistance, so you can use a square root uh, algorithm uh, to, to find this. So, that's uh, two to the n over two. So, these are the, the classic security properties. There, well, suddenly I jumped ahead there. Uh, there are a couple of uh, other things that we typically want. The first, of, first thing is you want to actually compute this hash function on some actual data. So you want to be able to hash long inputs very quickly. And so hash functions are usually built for speed. And then there's a pseudo randomness, which is you want your hash function to, to act like a random oracle um, because your security proof for, for whatever crypto system that has a hash function as a component, typically at some point it's going to be saying, we've got something that looks like a pseudo random function uh, taking this data as inputs. And so uh, you want your hash function to, to basically be able to, to replace this in a, in a plausible way. So that means its outputs should look like uh, really random values of, uh, of the codomain in some sense. All right, so Charles Goran Lauda, what's interesting about it? Well, it's a hash function with a provable uh, pre-image resistance. Provable, not to say that this is some absolute thing that is a mathematical theorem that it has pre-image resistance. This means that there is some rigorous proof that reduces the problem of computing pre-images to an actual interesting number theoretic problem, uh, uh, something that maybe uh, we, we can study, uh, like, well, in this case, uh, the, the isogeny problem. Okay, so the parameters, we've got our prime P. We're going to need an ordering on FP squared. Uh, that's just arbitrary. You can make it the lexicographical order, whatever you want. The idea is this is then giving you an, an ordering on J invariance or an ordering on vertices. Uh, and then we're going to need a starting vertex J0. We're actually going to need a, a starting edge. So from J minus one into J0. Then there's this thing that's often left out, which is, uh, but which is kind of uh, squirreled away in the, in the paper, uh, which is that you need like a, some kind of a projection from FP squared onto FP. So just some random linear map, uh, you know, like adding the two components of, a, of an FP a squared element together or something like this, if you want. And then your hash function is you apply this projection or let's apply like the finalization map, I'll call it. You apply this to the output of a CGL, this function CGL, which is mapping from a bit strings into the super singular set as follows, basically it's a non-backtracking walk starting at J0, and so not immediately going back to J minus one, just always going forwards. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the, the walk is actually driven by the data. So each bit of the data, if you're at J0, well, you're in a three regular graph, one of the edges is going back to J minus one and you can't take that. So that leaves two edges, you just, decide which of them is bigger using your ordering, uh, which of the, 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 the possible uh, next vertices is bigger. Uh, if it's, uh, sorry, uh, having some random scrolling things, then you go, uh, let's say uh, left, otherwise you go right. So the, the bit of the data is telling you which of the two uh, next vertices to choose as you go along. And then the output is just the end of this walk. JN for, for an n bit uh, input. Clearly, I mean, it doesn't matter how many bits are in the input, you just keep walking until you're done and then output the last J invariant. Finding pre images for this function corresponds to solving the isogeny problem for L equals two. This is supposed to be hard. Our best algorithm is, uh, is square root. Uh, our quantum algorithm is, uh, is fourth root. So this is exponential with respect to, to the, the length of the, the output. Okay, so finding collisions for this function uh, corresponds to computing cycles. I mean, if you've got two paths, two distinct paths through the graph from J0 to the same other J, if you like, well, then you just connect the dual of one to the, to, to the other one and you've got a cycle back to J0. So finding collisions is really the same thing as finding a cycle through J0, uh, which is like 
computing uh, endomorphisms of degree two to the something of E0. That was supposed to be hard back when, uh, when this uh, function was supposed to be proposed. Uh, but now we know that if you know the endomorphism ring of the starting curve or a curve representing the starting J invariant, then this is actually polynomial time. And this is a, a problem for us uh, in that we don't really know how to construct uh, just a random looking element of, uh, of this set, you know, like a, basically an, a, a super singular curve whose endomorphism ring we, we don't know um, without doing something like taking a random walk from uh, a curve whose endomorphism ring we do know, like J invariant zero or 1728 or you know, some, some reduction mod P of a, of a CM curve. So uh, in, uh, in theory, this is still kind of a tricky problem, uh, but in reality, given the, the kinds of uh, starting vertices that we have, um, this is polynomial time. So collision resistance is problematic for this function, but pre-image resistance is, is still interesting. And basically fixing that problem or closing that gap or, uh, or finding uh, interesting random uh, elements efficiently in the super singular graph, basically sampling in a uniform way from this graph, uh, that'd be great. But even just finding any uh, element where you don't know a connection back to uh, some obvious uh, super singular curve with, with a known endomorphism ring. This is hard. Um, so the traditional approach to actually computing the function uh, is, uh, and this is one way it's often presented, you have your modular polynomial of degree two. So you know this is a degree, well, of level two. So this is a degree three in, uh, in the two variables. Um, we uh, evaluate this at, uh, at ji, not j1, and some variable x. That's going to give us a polynomial of degree three. It's three roots of the three neighbors in the two isogeny graph. Uh, one of them is backtracking, so we just cancel out by that factor, that linear factor, and uh, we're left with a quadratic. We find its two roots. That implies finding a square root in fp squared, which is about as much work as uh, two square roots in fp. And then you just choose which of the roots, which of these neighboring vertices you're going to use uh, according to uh, your ordering on FP squared and, uh, and the chosen bit, uh, well, the, the bit in question. So we repeat this process, we repeat this process, we repeat this process, and every bit that you're treating, you know you're going to have to take one square root in FP squared, and that's really uh, the main part of the work that you're going to have to do. I'll give an alternative approach, uh, which is going to, uh, I mean, in some sense, it's isomorphic. It's just that uh, this is going to uh, blend more nicely with genus two. We're going to put our elliptic curves in the form uh, y squared is, well, a cubic, but with uh, a point of order two at zero, zero. Okay, so there, there's a root of the cubic. We'll shift that to zero. We're working over FP squared. So, uh, I mean, all of the two isogenies are going to be FP squared rational. So actually uh, the cubic has three rational roots. So we're just shifting one of them to zero here. And then to find your next edge, if this is EI, this, uh, this curve here, well, we just uh, solve the quadratic, find the two roots of the quadratic here. We're going to have to actually compute them because uh, this curve has just been presented to us somehow, not in, not in factored form. Uh, and then we use our bit in the data to choose which of these two roots, which is corresponding to a two torsion point, which is corresponding to a two isogeny kernel, which is corresponding to an edge in the graph. We use our bit to choose which one uh, we're going to take. And then we uh, compute. So that's basically uh, using some rule. It's choosing a sign on uh, this, uh, this square root that we need to compute in FP squared. And then uh, we very easily work out the, the next curve in our walk. And the idea of using these formulae is then that the, the dual edge is uh, just the, this distinguished uh, point of order two, the zero, zero point. So going forwards, you're just going to solve the quadratic again, solve the quadratic again. It really just comes down to computing one square root, making a choice uh, on that square root, and then uh, continuing like this. At the end, you'll get your curve EN, you'll take its J invariant, and then you'll apply that finalization map pi to mash your, your result down into FP. Either way, you're doing this one square root in FP squared per bit of input. So why do you bother with this, uh, this finalization map pi here? Well, basically because 
the CGL function, when it's outputting a J invariant, it's outputting an element of FP squared, but there's only P over 12 elements of the, uh, this set. There's only P over 12 vertices in the graph. So even though we've got the uniform distribution on this, once your message uh, input is, is long enough, and uh, typically we're, we're hashing long messages, uh, this means that we've only got like log P bits of entropy here. So that means we should be uh, squashing our hash values down to about log P bits instead of two log P bits. Basically that would correspond to one element of FP. Turns out that a sufficiently general linear function will, will do the trick for you. So don't use something like the trace that will give you a collision between a J invariant and its conjugate, both of which are super singular and you can work out uh, the, the conjugate walk very easily but take something sufficiently random, but not ridiculous to compute. Uh, so a, a small linear combination will do the job. Even if you can solve the isogeny problem, then to invert the, the true hash function, you, you also have to be able to find a pre-image under this map. And this is, uh, it's, it's kind of hard, harder to say something formal about this, uh, but this already seems to be kind of difficult. Um, Let's just say that, that this is an, an open problem, I think, uh, given just a linear map from FP squared to FP, something that's not like the trace, for example, but just some uh, random looking linear map. Well, take the trace if you want. And then given some random element of FP, find a super singular pre-image if it exists. Uh, I mean, uh, you, would, you would expect with like a random projection from this set, uh, you'd be thinking there's zero or one pre-images, um, you know, like a one out of 12 times or something, there might be a pre-image. Um, sometimes two pre-images, sometimes three, but that gets more and more rare. Uh, uh, so somehow find this thing in, in time less than, well, like uh, than brute force. Uh, is an, I think weird, easy to state, but weirdly difficult problem. Okay, so now let's go to genus two. Here we're going to, to restrict to super special uh, principal or principally polarized abelian surfaces. Um, this means that it's going to be isomorphic to a product of super singular elliptic curves once you drop the polarization on your uh, abelian surface. More generally, super singular abelian surfaces, uh, they're, they're isogenous to product of uh, super singular curves, uh, but not necessarily isomorphic. So super special is a special case of super singular. It's preserved by, by separable isogenies, so by uh, LLL uh, isogenies or LL isogenies, in the case of genus two, which is uh, what we'll be working with. Uh, super special, if you want to leave the super special subgraph and head off into the, the super singular graph, well, knock yourself out. You're just going to need a like a p isogeny to do this. Um, the super singular graph, uh, the full super singular graph, then ends up being kind of infinite somehow, I guess. But uh, but anyway, I, I just want to mention that the the p isogenies, you think when you're coming from elliptic curves, oh, this just means oh yeah, take Frobenius or a conjugate or something and a, a Galois conjugate, and and off you go. Now we're in a super special land, but it's much more complicated than that. And, uh, and so I'll give you this uh, reference uh, to, to Brock and Howe, which shows you just in the very simplest case already how totally weird things can, can get. I really uh, recommend uh, checking out this paper. It's really cool. Okay, so in higher genus, for, for every G greater than zero, every prime P, we've got a, a set of uh, super special principally polarized abelian varieties up to isomorphism. Uh, and there's about P to the G, G plus one over two uh, elements in this set. Uh, for G less than or equal to three, we've got really much more precise statements here. Uh, and then we're going to look at the, the isogeny graph on here. And rather than taking isogenies of degree L, we're going to take uh, isogenies whose kernels are maximal L by isotropic subgroups of the L torsion. These groups are all basically Z mod L Z to the G. And the idea is that the, the isogenies that you that you get when you take quotients by this will respect uh, the principal polarizations. So this graph that we get then is connected. It's uh, regular. The, the the degree of the of that regularity though is is a bit more complicated. Well, we've already seen in dimension one for elliptic curves, it's L plus one. In dimension two, which is what we're really interested in, it's uh, L cubed plus L plus one times L plus one. So when L is two, for example, we go from being three regular to 15 regular. Uh, and then 
well, in any case, you can see the the, the number of uh, of edges going out is is getting much bigger. It's a much richer graph in that sense. And in general, the the number of, uh, of edges going out is a polynomial in, in L of degree uh, uh, g times g plus one over two. It's quadratic in G. So let's just get back to the equivalent of, uh, of the two isogeny uh, graph for elliptic curves. For abelian surfaces, we're looking at a 15 regular uh, graph. So you think, all right, I've just got vertices with 15 edges going out. Uh, and um, your naive idea is I'll just keep pasting these together. I'm going to sort of tessellate uh, with, uh, with this graph and uh, this, this little neighborhood and fill it out into an entire graph. Uh, we've got some, uh, some issues then, like you go, well, let's genera generalize the hash function to, to this setting. You go, well, it, it might be cooler because there's more edges, right? So uh, that means I can, I can somehow treat more data with each choice rather than there's only two legitimate output edges I can only treat one bit with each isogeny step. Well, here already with the in genus two for L equals two, you go, well, I can treat like 14 bits of, well, not bits, like log two 14 bits uh, each time or something like this, like three and a bit bits um, of data with each isogeny step. Maybe if I take bigger Ls or bigger Gs, the, the graph structure is getting richer and richer. Maybe I can uh, lose myself in it faster and, uh, and push more data into the walk. So, why not? But then uh, the question is, well, what is the distribution of the endpoints of these walks going to look like? Uh, is this like a, like a Ramanujan graph? How far do you have to walk in this thing before it looks like you've got a uniform distribution? So what are the expansion properties like? Uh, and this thing is not Ramanujan. Uh, there, are, there are explicit counterexamples. But that's not really a problem for cryptographers. Like it's an interesting question uh, for, for number theory, I think. But uh, uh, and when you're looking at the spectral properties of these graphs, which is something that's really interesting uh, when you when you're looking at like modular forms and things. But for cryptographers, you go, we just need to have decent expansion properties. You know, like relatively short walks, like a short multiple, a small multiple of log p uh, steps, and then we could be anywhere in the graph. That will do. And so with uh, Enric uh, Florit. Um, We've done a lot of experiments, uh, also some theoretical work, and can say that basically this should be good enough uh, for cryptographic applications. You know, like uh, it's not like things are going to go going to go catastrophically wrong based on these distributions. So we're we're not as ideal as something like a Ramanujan graph, but we're not like a million miles away from that either. So the the first person to generalize this uh, to to principally polarized abelian varieties of dimension two was Takashima. And he uh, did this using uh, super singular genus two curves to represent the vertices, because a, a general uh, principally polarized abelian surface is the Jacobian of a genus two curve. And the nice thing there is that in, in a similar way is you can do the charles goren lauder function without knowing about modular polynomials if you just use roots of uh, the cubic in your Weierstrass model. So if you don't know about principally polarized abelian surfaces and you just know about uh, y squared equals a, a quintic or a sextic uh, being a genus two curve, you can use Richelieu's formula to compute the isogeny steps. Uh, this is a, like a, a classic you know, 19th century way of computing two, two isogenies. And then at the end, you're gonna have to actually output something. And so he outputs the, the analog of the Jane variant, which is your agusa klebsch variant. So that's a, a triple of elements of FP squared. Now, the really funky thing about uh, this function is that since the graph is 15 regular, you're hashing your data, uh, you know, you've got to recode your input in base 14, uh, which is a, a pretty rare thing to do in cryptography. I think uh, base 14 is a pretty rare thing, uh, full stop. Um, so that's a really unique fe feature of this hash function. How does Richelieu's formula actually work? To make this explicit, I just want to show you that this is this is not hard. It's not complicated. When you've got a genus two curve, it looks like y squared equals a sextic. Although, uh, so you can write this as a product of three quadratics. Uh, there's more than one way of doing this, obviously, but let's write this down. You could have one of the roots being at infinity, so uh, one of these quadratics might actually be linear, but we'll just think of them as being projective quadratics. Then each of these quadratics is actually specifying a point of order two in the Jacobian. Uh, that that element, if you want to represent it as a divisor, it's like the difference of the two Weierstrass points where that where that uh, that g polynomial vanishes. Uh, 
And then the fact that these uh, these three quadratics specifying three uh, non-trivial two torsion uh, points are all uh, you know co-prime to each other, uh, they're, they're all distinct and and co-prime. Uh, that's giving you the, the, the two vey isotropy condition. And so this thing is going to be the kernel of a 2 2 isogeny. And what Richelieu does is he gives you uh, the, the co domain in a really ex explicit way. What you need to do is uh, just compute a couple of uh, derivatives and, uh, and sort of cross multiples of these things. So, yeah, the, we're going to produce three new quadratics. As, uh, so, hi is gj prime gk minus gj gk. GK prime uh, for cyclic permutations IJK of one, two, three, and then uh, we get a determinant of these three quadratics, and uh, we've got an explicit form for the codomain curve. You can also write down uh, correspondence representing the isogeny if you want to actually evaluate it, but we don't want to do that. Uh, Gin is two isogeny based uh, crypto, at least not for the hash function. But there's already a problem with this hash function, uh, which is uh, goes back to, to Flynn and T. Uh, they were trying to do SDH in, uh, in genus two, and they observed that uh, it's actually really easy to construct uh, cycles of length four starting at any vertex in this graph. So uh, this, this of course, will totally destroy your collision resistance, your second pre-image resistance. This is really catastrophic. Uh, and rather than writing down a formula for uh, for these things, uh, we'll just show you a picture. And what you're going to see is that if you look at the neighborhood of a general edge in the graph, then for every Two, two isogeny. So let's take these uh, these sort of bold edges here. Uh, so we'll just let's say we're going from uh, the left bold vertex to the right bold vertex here uh, forward with uh, with one of these heavy arrows. Well, then there are lots of ways of getting back to the starting one. So this is the neighborhood of a general edge here. Uh, what's going on here is uh, we're saying that there's actually many ways of, uh, of factoring uh, multiplication by four that don't involve factoring a multiplication by two on an abelian surface. We can take a two, I, two, two isogeny, then we're not gonna backtrack, that's forbidden, but we can sort of step off to one side, maybe uh, taking one of the other backwards looking arrows. Uh, and then from that neighbor, there's going to be a choice of arrows to another neighbor. Uh, at this point, we'll have a two two isogeny going forwards, another two two isogeny stepping back into the side, they're composing to give a, a 4 2, two isogeny. Our next choice here uh, is going to give us a, like a, a 4 4 2, two isogeny. And then finally, our last step back to the original vertex is going to complete us into a 4 4 4 4 isogeny, which is isomorphic to multiplication by 4. So you can, I mean, you can do this, uh, you can also argue this uh, combinatorially in terms of uh, the subgroups of the 2 torsion and the 4 torsion. The moral of the story is that. Forbidding backtracking is not enough. There are six other edges that we're also not allowed to take because from there it would be too easy to step back to the starting vertex. So what we're going to do is given one edge, uh, we're going to talk about extensions of that edge. So like one edge with respect to the previous edge. So we'll say that phi prime is an extension of an isogeny phi. Uh, we'll say it's a good extension if the composition is an L squared L squared isogeny. So it's sort of uh, as close to a, a cyclic isogeny as we're going to get in this context where nothing's exactly cyclic. It's a bad isogeny if it's one of these things where you've kind of half heading in the in the backwards direction. It's like a, a semi backtracking thing. So uh, that's one of our heading back in the leftwards direction without backtracking uh, isogenies here. You can see there's six of them. And then uh, we'll say you're dual if you're the dual isogeny. And then the composition is going to be multiplication by L. And so basically L cubed of your isogenies going forwards are good, L squared plus L are bad, and one is dual. So in our case, L equals two, there are eight good ones. Uh, so eight things where you're going to end with a four, four isogeny, and then choosing one of the next eight, an eight, eight isogeny, one of the next eight will give you 16, 16 isogeny. So you're going to continue with something that is as close to cyclic as you can get. So we'll call that good. The others are bad and the other is not ugly, it's just the dual. So working with uh, Walter and, uh, and Thomas, we tried to repair this, uh, this hash function by just using this uh, new rule for the isogeny walks. Instead of saying there's no backtracking, we're like, just use the good extensions. 
there's now eight good options to go forwards. This way we'll avoid this, uh, these uh, trivial collisions uh, that's going to uh, then give us uh, hash walks that are L to the N, L to the N isogenies. And we won't get any of these short cycles. We'll be back much more in something resembling the elliptic uh, case. So when we put this into practice, uh, following uh, Takashima, we're just going to work with genus two curves and the Richelieu isogenies as a proof of concept. So then the question is, well, what are the good, uh, the good extensions look like in this case? If you've taken a step from CI or it's Jacobian to the Jacobian of CI plus one, Richelieu's formula have uh, outputted three of these quadratics, uh, H1i, H2i, H3i. Uh, and so now you have to work out what's my next step going to be. So you, this is taking the sextic that's a product of H1, H2, H3, splitting it up again and uh, re rearranging the pieces into new quadratics. There's going to be 15 ways of doing that. It's giving us 15 extensions. One of them's dual, and that's just using these HIs. Uh, or sorry, HJs to go back again. So if your, your quadratic splitting is uh, the one that Richelieu gave you, this is going to give you the dual. The bad extensions are just the ones where you keep one of the Gs and then uh, switch around the roots of, uh, well, no, where you keep one of the Hs to be a new G and then uh, pair up uh, the, the roots of the other two Hs in sort of crossing pairs to go on. So you're, you're basically keeping one of Richelieu's quadratics in order to go on. This is bad. And so the good extensions are you take these three H polynomials, you split them all up, and then you pair up all of their roots in a new way. Okay, there's eight ways of doing that. Uh, that's going to give us our eight good extensions. So to get the good extensions, since we're not allowed to keep any of the H's as they are, we've got to split them all up and repair up all the roots. We're going to have to do three square roots in FP squared. To, to compute our set of eight good extensions, or indeed even to compute any one of them. Uh, even if we could predict somehow uh, which way to go, we're, we're still going to have to split these three quadratics and, uh, and get three square roots. Now there's this minor inconvenience, uh, like I'm saying, we're modeling these vertices as, uh, as genus two curves, but the, there's another kind of principally polarized abelian surface, which is elliptic products. I mean, these are actually the, the, the simplest abelian surfaces, it's just a product of two elliptic curves, or the square of an elliptic curve would be uh, even simpler, while simultaneously making things more complicated. Now, why I say this is an inconvenience, uh, the first thing is that the isomorphism invariants are, are different, right? Like uh, for Jacobians of genus two curves, you're using uh, like this uh, triple of Igusa Klebsch invariants. For uh, elliptic products, you've got a pair of J invariants. Okay, so that's two elements of FP squared. Um, this is not exactly the same thing. So let's say these things fundamentally have a, a different kind of type. The other thing is that uh, when you start on a Jacobian and then your next step is going to land on an elliptic product, Richelieu's formulae will actually break down. So that delta, if we come back here, so delta, it's this constant that, uh, the scaling constant that goes in front of the, the y squared on the codomain curve, that'll be zero. So what you're getting is not a genus two curve, it's zero equals the polynomial in X. So it really de degenerates there and you're gonna have to switch to other formulae, uh, which are also classical to uh, basically compute a two, two splitting of your genus two curve. So that means you're gonna have to switch algorithms at that point, it means if you're trying to do your, your hashes like a, uh, a constant time um, uh, thing, which you're going to need if you're uh, if you're hashing a secret data at some point, which is what you do in a lot of applications. It means you're going to have to do something really kind of fiddly here to somehow simultaneously handle the the curves and the elliptic products. So uh, Dave Rowe had a question uh, asking uh, if there was an obvious typo in my slides. There's always an obvious. Uh, typo in my slides in this case. So there are three ones instead of a one, two, three. So uh, thanks, uh, Enric, for, for confirming that. So when I say this is a minor inconvenience, I've said why it's inconvenient. Why is it kind of minor? Well, because there are many fewer uh, elliptic uh, products than there are Jacobians. I mean, that fits with the, with the moduli spaces, right? Like three elements of FP squared uh, uh, that you're going to need for a, for a, an abelian surface, well, for a, for a Jacobian, for FP squared, and two that you're going to need for an elliptic product. Uh, so if we break our, our super singular set into two subsets, then uh, really what we're going to get is uh, one over 2,880 p cubed, more or less, uh, Jacobians. And 
only one over 288 p squared elliptic products. So when we were putting this into practice and uh, seeing what happened, we took this really simple cop out here and just failed on elliptic products. Of course, that's completely illegal. Uh, you can't do that. I mean, a hash function is not allowed to fail, but we just figured for cryptographically large P, the proportion of elliptic products in this whole graph, it's like one over P. P is going to be, uh, you know, like in the, the hundreds of bits here that you were never ever going to land on one of these vertices. We were certainly never going to land on one in our experiments. So we just didn't implement the elliptic product stuff here. And you think, all right, well, you could probably get away with this in practice, uh, but there's some bad news, which is that the elliptic products are rare, but they're not rare enough. We'll get back to that very shortly. First, let's just take a closer look at this graph. So at first I was saying your naive version, uh, vision of this graph, because you want to somehow, you know, like visualize what's going on. You think, take this sort of 15, uh, 15 edge star and just uh, patch these together to somehow uh, cover the graph. But it's, it's not looking like, uh, like the, the nice uh, three regular expanding thing uh, that, that we get from doing that in the elliptic case, because I mean, we saw what a, what a generic edge looked like just before. Uh, I mean, it looked like this. Okay, so we can see the way you glue together two neighboring uh, vertices, well, the neighborhoods of uh, two vertices, is actually uh, quite tricky. Like a lot of their neighbors are going to somehow end up being neighbors of each other later on. So the picture is fund fundamentally more complicated. Uh, you can make a lot of sense of this and also of the weights on the edges uh, uh, and the, the, the directions of the various edges uh, by looking at what happens with the automorphism group. Automorphism groups are more complicated in genus two than they are with elliptic curves. It's not like you just have two special elliptic curves and that's the end of the story. We've got whole families of interesting, interesting things in genus two. So Katsura and Takashima uh, looked at this first and then uh, Enric and I pushed this a bit further later on and uh, basically tried to build a visual guide to patching these graphs together. And there's, a, there's a reference for that and at the end of the slides. Um, and what we find is that when you get closer to things with non-trivial uh, reduced automorphism groups, your edges uh, pick up interesting weights and your graph starts to look more and more kind of uh, gnarly. You get some intuition on this from this, uh, this uh, ratio principle uh, or what we call the ratio principle, which is when you look at the weight on an edge and you look at the weight on a dual, typically this is one and one in, uh, you know, in, at a general uh, edge in your isogeny graph. Um, and that's corresponding to the fact that the automorphism groups of the two vertices uh, have the same size. I mean, they're typically both just plus or minus one. But as your automorphism groups get bigger, that's going to, and, uh, and those automorphisms are maybe not preserved by some isogenies, that's going to make uh, the weights on these edges uh, bigger and uh, change the, the way that they line up. Um, and so already you see that anytime you've got an elliptic product, you know that the neighboring Jacobians, so they're the things marked I on the left here, that's uh, I for type one, which is uh, like some, like a, I guess sort of a cleft classification of, of these things. The reduced automorphism group there is a C2. So there, there's an involution other than minus one on these Jacobians. So there are six neighbors like that. And, uh, and then nine elliptic product neighbors, which is just what you get from taking products of elliptic isogenies. So the interesting ones are these uh, gluings, I guess, which are giving you these six Jacobians. But then you go, all right, I'll, maybe I've moved off an elliptic product onto a Jacobian. So now I'm in the center of the right vertex. And when I move off there, you think I could either somehow preserve this extra automorphism and then I'll have a simple edge. I could head back to my elliptic product or I could head on to uh, like a more general thing, but there's only four general neighbors rather than eight of them. And you have double edges uh, heading out. So this can happen anytime you have an extra, like one extra involution on a Jacobian, right? Which I mean, there are whole families of these curves. There's over P squared of these sorts of vertices. So it's no longer like J invariant zero in 1728. We've got a big subset of things that are tricky. And so looking at more of these, uh, these sort of edges, if you just look at the edge between 
and Lipwick product and its nearest Jacobi, and you can see that the, the neighborhood is already starting to get a bit fiddlier than, uh, than the, the, the neighborhood of a general edge looks. Um, if you allow one more uh, um, involution on your Jacobi, and, and this is what would naturally happen if you sort of glue together the, the two torsion on an elliptic square, you're going to get more elliptic squares. You'll get some elliptic products. You're going to get some uh, some Jacobians with uh, two extra involutions on it. You're also going to get some endomorphisms. You can see uh, just the neighborhood of an elliptic square is already much more complicated. Uh, and then the neighborhood of the Jacobians, these types of pre-Jacobians, it's also something that looks really unusual when you're expecting like a 15 regular star. And there's O of P of these in the, in the graph. And there's O of P cube things in the whole graph so these are rare but there's still a lot of them it's no longer just two special vertices when you start connecting these and starting to walk around you can see that there's a lot of potential for your walks to statistically behave uh, in ways that you maybe weren't expecting uh, but we sort of looked into this and we find that well uh, the, the expansion properties are still okay um, the the constants are not as good as they are in the elliptic case you're, you're getting far from Ramanujan but a lot of the explanation for that is really coming from these weights their frequency and the interplay between all of these uh, these things so for more information on that uh, check out uh, uh, the papers with uh, with Enric Florent so now let's get back to, to cryptography and we'll get back to this isogeny problem so what we want to do here is generalize the Charles Gore and Lauder hash to maybe arbitrary dimension if you want. And so you think, okay, well, uh, I should be able to do some uh, random walk in my L isogeny graph uh, for a suitable choice of L and a suitable choice of G. Uh, I'll have already checked that the expansion properties are fine, uh, that, that this is uh, gonna give me a good distribution. I'll find some, uh, some efficient way of actually computing these isogeny steps. It's still going to be a lot of square roots or something, um, or, or ilth roots, who knows, uh, this is uh, actually gonna be extremely slow. Uh, but I'm always going to be able to solve this isogeny problem just using random walks, like using a generic algorithm uh, in square root time. So that means I'm expecting to have like uh, p to the g times g plus one over two, uh, but uh, divided by two again. I'm expecting some sort of quadratic exponent with respect to g for the difficulty of the isogeny problem. And you think, well, that's cool. Like uh, that's that's growing fast. Maybe hygiene is things are, are promising. Working with Craig, we showed that it's actually the opposite. Uh, the higher genus goes, the worse things get, and really, really quickly says that there's a classical algorithm that will solve your isogeny problem, not in square root time, uh, but in like gth root time, roughly speaking. Uh, the, the exponent is only a linear in G and that's a classical algorithm. You can do it in the square root of this uh, as a quantum algorithm. We're just gonna quickly show you how the classical algorithm works for this in genus two. This is kind of the key thing and then everything else works by induction. So if you look at the isogeny graph as just being a generic uh, you know, NGL regular Ramanujan graph or expander or whatever, uh, so in sort of ideal world, solving the pathfinding problem is going to take you the square root of P to the G, G plus one over two. That's how many classical isogeny steps you're going to need uh, using random walks. And the, the key observation here is that actually the number of elliptic product things in genus two already is bigger than the square root of the Jacobians or the square root of the size of the entire graph. So rather than trying to have uh, two random walks uh, walking into each other in a, in a square root algorithm, what we're going to do is take this huge obvious uh, special subset. When I say it's huge, uh, the elliptic subset, it has like O of P squared elements in it that's exponential in log p, but it's also uh, exponentially small with respect to the whole set because uh, like only one in p things is in it. So this is still a, a big enough subset to, to be useful because it's bigger than the square root. We're just going to try random walks into that special subset and then work with elliptic algorithms from then on. So in the genus two case, we just take random walks 
into elliptic product vertices. The expander hypothesis, like assuming that uh, you're going to have to do about uh, log p steps or 15 log p steps or something like this, you're going to, you'll very quickly be anywhere in the graph, which means there's a one in p chance that you're in the elliptic uh, product graph. So you're going to have to try this about p times. Uh, but that's all right. That's less than the square root of uh, p, to, p to the three. So, uh, so, so far you're winning. Then you just need a path between the two elliptic products that you find. Um, and to do that, we have this, uh, this really dirty hack. Um, and there's probably a better way of doing this, but uh, a hack will suffice. Uh, we just solve the isogeny problem in genus one twice, just on the two factors. And that's like a square root P uh, generic algorithm. And then you just want to zip these two together, like just to take the products of these paths and that's going to give you like a, a walk, but maybe they don't have the same length. So if they, provided the lengths have the same parity, you can just make one of the walks, uh, like it, it's finished a bit early, just make it backtrack backwards and forwards a bit to, to sort of uh, fill in time and, and mark time until the other walker finally arrives. So stretch it out with some backtracking on one factor. Weirdly enough, this is not backtracking on uh, the whole factor. Uh, so uh, it's out. So this is uh, this is actually like basically deliberately doing a bad extension, uh, I think uh, on some level, but uh, I think you can fix this trick to work with good things uh, using some of our, our later results on the structure of uh, the isogeny graph. So this lets you zip together these uh, elliptic paths. Uh, you've computed them in, uh, in root p time. You found your paths to the elliptic subgraph in uh, in or with p uh, time, ignoring log factors, and this is therefore going to solve you uh, the isogeny problem in a softer with p uh, isogeny steps. And then to go into higher dimensions, it's basically the very similar idea. You just start with a general surface and you take a random walk until there's some elliptic factor in it. And uh, this set of things that have at least one elliptic factor is uh, is much bigger than the square root of the whole space. So you can then peel off that elliptic factor, solve uh, an isogeny problem there, and then uh, recursively keep going down until you hit genus two and then genus one. So that gives you this uh, this efficient uh, high dimensional isogeny problem thing. And wait, wait, I'm just going to skip over this quickly so we can get to some conclusions. The conclusion from that is uh, basically that, uh, well, like to, to come back oops, to, to this algorithm, uh, the total cost is uh, P to the, the G minus one. And you can parallelize this uh, kind of trivially, but let's say you just don't know on one processor, P to the G minus one, this is much faster than what you were hoping for, which was P to the G, G plus one over four. Okay, uh, it's, it's like a whole factor of G uh, better in the exponent. So that means that if you want something equivalent to like uh, the an, an elliptic uh, isogeny graph hash function, like equivalent security, so equivalent to pre-image resistance, the bigger G gets, the bigger P you're going to have to, to take somehow to compared with the, the, the overall size of the graph. So the number of vertices, uh, the size of the, the hash values, uh, the, the entropy in the graph, you're going to have to actually blow up P larger than you want in order to make uh, the, uh, the isogeny problem uh, hard enough. So it's going to be bad, but already if you just look in genus two, what's this saying? Uh, it means that we've got cube root isogeny finding instead of square root isogeny finding. That's just the, the, the simple upshot of this in genus two. So that means that um, if you're trying to do genus one isogeny based hashing and you want lambda bits of, uh, of uh, pre-image resistance, so that means you want your adversary to do about two to the lambda uh, isogeny steps or the equivalent in order to compute the pre-image. Well, with elliptic curves, there are about P over 12 vertices in the graph and pre-image finding is square root. So that means you're going to need P to be on the order of two to the two lambda. So a two lambda bit prime. That means that the J invariant at the end is going to be four lambda bits long, which is way too long. Uh, I mean, ideally, if you were using like an industrial uh, hash function, you wouldn't have all this nice number theory going on, but you'd have a lambda bit output for the same security level, the same claimed security level. 
we can use our finalization map to squash us down to two lambda bit outputs, and we can't really go lower than that because uh, I mean there's only uh, like log p things in the in the set here. At least we can't go sub. Uh, 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 interestingly, uh, smaller than this. Sorry, I'm forgetting my, my native language. Uh, on the other hand, this is slow already. Okay, so every input bit, you're going to need a square root in FP squared, which is two like square roots in FP. So two, two lambda bit modular exponentiations. That's pretty slow. Genus two, it's about P cubed. Uh, vertices, so cube root pre image finding means uh, you're going to need uh, P to be about two to the lambda. So you get to use a smaller prime P here. You're trading that off against your, your higher genus. You're going to end up with the uh, longer outputs though, like six lambda bit outputs this time because you've got three FP squared elements forming your modulo point uh, for, for a general surface, which you can then finalize down to three lambda bits. Uh, the actual finalization map that you're going to use, it's uh, no one's really talked about this. It's not really uh, clear whether, like, what kind of a linear combination you should do, or if a uh, linear combination is a, is even a good idea, or you know, basically whether there's any security uh, being destroyed uh, by mapping down to three lambda bits. But either way, you're fatter than you were before. You're using more space. Uh, you know, this is a uh, this is bad. Your your hashes are fifty percent uh, fatter than they would have been in genus one. On the other hand, you're a bit faster because you get to you have to do three square roots in FP squared, but that lets you handle three bits of uh, input at, uh, at once, uh, and you can do these in uh, in parallel if you want. Okay. So uh, here, the fact that this is faster, it looks like three square roots in FP squared to do three bits, but your P is half the size in genus two here. We don't have any solution for this collision resistance issue, like uh, choosing a random looking starting, starting vertex in either case. Okay, so I think that's, uh, that's still this, uh, this really fascinating problem of can you generate or sample a, a random looking or anonymous looking uh, element of the super singular set. Uh, in genus one, this is already a really interesting problem that everyone's stuck on. In genus two, it's, uh, uh, it could be easier who knows? Uh, I think it's uh, an even more interesting uh, problem to think about there, just because uh, the geometry of these things is so much more interesting. And because we have these connections to elliptic curves and polarizations and so on, that might give us a handle on uh, producing something really interesting.